It's a very good session, very good uh, vendor panel that we had there. Was yeah, I think that was a healthy conversation. I think there was some yeah. good back and forth. Yeah, I was actually really happy that um, we have, you know, the, the booths and stuff to go to to talk to these folks a little bit more. Um, I have questions of my own that I would like to get answers for. So um, very interesting. Deborah, you can see my my screen, right? That I'm sharing. I can, yep, I can. And you can get started whenever you're ready. I don't know if we're able to see who's in here. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, you could. I'm not sure. I was just going to ask that. Um, Yeah, I don't have a clear view on whether we have viewers or not. Okay, Colin, you can go ahead and start. Ah, there Whenever we go. Okay, so you see someone in there. I guess we can't see it on from our side. So I'll, I'll get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on data commercialization. And the longer title is we're going to talk about a multi-layer data marketplace. We're essentially going to talk about the different experiences and segmentation you can create to drive revenue uh, from your marketplace. Uh, so what we'll cover today are these general topics. So first, we want to go to the basics, which is how do data products impact your go-to-market model? How do they impact how you structure your teams to effectively sell data and market data? Uh, we're then going to lead that into what is the value of a multi-layer marketplace and how that enables the GTM model. We're going to talk a little bit about pricing the data products, which is obviously a, a really big part of commercialization. And then instead of us coming up with you know, any kind of theory, we're going to talk about one of our core customers, CME Group, which is the largest stock exchange in the world, and how they built a $100 million data business. So I'll start with a quick introduction, even though you heard a little bit about us through the technology panel. Uh, we are Revelate. We're a market leader in data marketplaces. And as uh, Ian Gilbert, our CEO, talked about on the vendor panel, we are a data fulfillment platform. We really focus on getting data from anywhere to anyone in both the data sharing and data commercialization use case, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, and before we really get in, I just want to ground us. Uh, I find the term data monetization gets used in a bunch of different capacities. And, and at Revelate, we have a very clear distinction that data monetization is the overarching term where you're generating economic benefit from your data, right? So that, could, that covers all everything under the sun where you are generating value from data. We then split that into clear, two very clear and distinct categories because they're fundamentally different motions. Data commercialization, which we're talking about today, is, is really when there's revenue associated to the underlying information. Uh, and so there's a licensing motion, there's an, an active go-to-market motion versus data sharing where there's still potentially a, an economic benefit, where it's, but it's typically focused on an internal efficiency that's gained uh, or an indirect value. Um, and that's, that's a separate topic, same mechanism of actions for both, but 
a fundamentally different motion. So we're going to focus on commercialization today. So we'll start. We'll start talking about what is the impact of a data product on your GTM model. And, and to try and simplify this conversation, we've got a grid here that we're going to start mapping data products to. On one side, we have the data product complexity, right? If it's low, so it's really easy, rudimentary, just a bunch of text files versus high complexity, which is a massive data set, much, bunch of different file types uh, that are stored in multiple different places, really changes the nature of how people can interact with the data product and the education required to interact effectively with it, which leads to the second axis, which is the sophistication of the data consumer. Uh, we deal with the whole range of sophistication from, you know, multinational financial institutions with dedicated data teams, with PhDs, with data engineering support who can handle a lot of complexity to young companies with a team of one or two people trying to commercialize some data. Um, and the relationship and the sophistication really impacts what you can, what you need to do to support them, to, to stand them up and help them generate revenue from their underlying data assets. So the way we, way we think about this and grid this out is in the bottom left, when it's low complexity and low consumer sophistication, it's really challenging for you to make the reasonable investment of hiring salespeople to, to go through that full relationship motion to get the data in their hands. You're typically going to then look at a marketing led motion where you're educating the market, doing some acquisition, maybe it's content, ads, um, general awareness that's going to bring people in and then ultimately transact. So these, you're typically going to look at public data products uh, of low complexity. And we'll get in more of the details of that a little bit later on. And you can see as this moves through the hybrid model in the, in the middle is where you still can't invest a ton into the relationship selling, which is what you see in the top right, where you have to really be, you know, hand to hand in, your, in supporting your customers to generate the revenue. But in the middle is a, is, a, is, a, is a combination where you typically see marketing have a lead generation focus uh, with a sales education. So it basically people will have questions and won't buy without some formal interaction. And so you need this hybrid marketing sales approach, typically in the middle when there's medium uh, data consumer sophistication and some degree of complexity in the product. Uh, and then it, again, I've already mentioned a little bit earlier, when we get into high sophistication and high complexity, this is where you really have to invest the time with your customers. Um, you'll see as we go through this, how this ultimately knocks on to how you set up your data marketplace, the, the price points, et cetera. But this gives a landscape on the investment in the motion, and it starts to, to highlight different things you will need to do to look at generating different streams of revenue in different ways. So let's take two examples. Let's start mapping some things against this grid. These are fictitious examples. You'll have to just bear with me to some degree on these. I'm trying to use it to, to illustrate a point. So I've just got a, a, a theoretical data product, which is logistics information, and it's being purchased by an operations department to, to do a supply chain analysis. Let's assume the operator, uh, the operations department is not your um, MBA, Excel ninja, SQL query uh, individual. Let's say it's a kind of middle of the road analyst. So they don't have a ton of sophistication. They understand how to interact with data, they interact with often, but they're not doing complex things. So in this, in this method, in terms of generating revenue or selling a data product to this kind of consumer, you're likely going to generate awareness through an industry-oriented marketplace, um, generating awareness through publicity, uh, advertising maybe, but ultimately, that individual would probably have some questions on access to data, how I get it, and would want some type of interface with the data provider before actually executing the transaction. Or at least that's the assumption in this. So that, that's an illustration of that hybrid model in the middle. And moving to the top right, let's assume we've got this massive big data set, um, terabytes upon terabytes of data, multiple data types, images, PDFs. And it's a, it's a long historical analysis of all these companies and, and their associated information. So it's not just the financials, it's all the alt data, which is, you know, their investor decks, it's, it's you know, other things associated to a big complicated, but you're selling it to a JP Morgan or a Goldman Sachs who have highly sophisticated people on the other side to consume it. 
you're likely going to encounter a complex procurement process where they have a lot of questions, a lot of demand because they're educated. They're, they're able to ask those sophisticated questions and have it a sophisticated use case for that data product. And so there's really no way around a, a high touch engagement. And this is going to be sales, solution architects, uh, potentially parts of your engineering team that get engaged to support this motion and support the delivery of this data product to this customer. So at this stage, we've got you know, a few different examples. We've got this grid. What does it look like in real life? <laughs> this is what it looks like in practice that we see is that very rarely when we talk about commercializing data, you're going to market with a single product. You usually have a whole host of different value you can create from your underlying pool of data um, that then gets productized into these different items. So that the process is actually mapping what you're bringing to market. And you can see this then requires you to have a variety of different tactics to engage with your customers. Um, and that's something we really want to emphasize and, and why we call this the multi-layer data marketplace. It's about personalizing the experience for the data consumer. If someone needs to just come in and access rudimentary data, you don't need to get in their way, they can self-serve. If someone comes in with needs a little bit of help understanding what to purchase, then you have that hybrid model. And if someone wants something highly complex for a very specific and sophisticated use case, that high engagement model. And so there isn't a one size fits all. And so from an administrative perspective of how do you layer the marketplace? What are the things that need to be present to provide the segmented experience so people get what they need the way they need it? I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, in, in reverse order of these. So I'm gonna start from uh, right to left instead of left to right. So the public versus private versus guided purchasing. So this notion of access. Uh, for some of our customers, and we'll talk about CME Group a little bit later on, a huge chunk of the revenue that they generate are from direct private sales. They do it off book. They, they have that high touch relationship. They ultimately broker off uh, offline and then come into the system and create a private experience for those specific and unique customers. So high touch customer cycle, private and curated experience when those individuals get into the marketplace to ultimately transact uh, and then distribute the data. The public marketplace we see as high value for those who are generating awareness or have those low to mid complexity data products uh, that they want to create more volume around. Um, and, and what we're seeing is sometimes, and we'll, we'll show you a little bit of data later on, something like the CME does both. And from doing both, they're able to actually create a whole host of value and new customers, not only for, for purchasing or doing data licensing, but in their other services as well. So we'll talk, and then the, the last one is the guided purchase when someone's repeated or um, they need a bit of curation. So this is when someone logs into your data marketplace and you're giving a curated view of the different items they should purchase. So not necessarily private, not necessarily public, that hybrid in the middle. To enable all of this, you need to do granular products. You have to find the products that meet the market need. And I think this is one of the single biggest drivers we've seen in scaling data businesses is the ability to create the appropriate data products for the, the customer's use case. Um, you'll see customers or young companies who are looking to commercialize their data start as just bulk data providers. They'll give you the whole data set. And it's a great way to get into the market and get up and going, but it's not ultimately what in hel helps you scale revenue. As we talked about before, you've got these customers with different use cases that need different levels of interaction and the ability to truly productize and create those granular products really, really facilitates revenue generation. Uh, and an another item to add on to that is the ingestion of third-party data. More and more we're seeing that first-party data is not enough to solve the whole problem for the consumer. The ability to have your first party data combined with third party data to create products of products and bring those together really adds a ton of value uh, and can generate a, a lot of revenue because you're really single, now a single source of, of access for your customer. And the last that's really important is figuring out the, the associated and appropriate licensing model 
for each data product. Um, subscriptions, one times, pay as you go. I'll, I'll make a note on subscriptions. Uh, we That's doing a lot of heavy lifting. That can be a subscription to a single data product. That can be a subscription to a group of data products. Or in some of our customers' case, it's an all-you-can-eat subscription. They'll give you a subscription. You'll pay a single annual price or monthly price to access all the data products they have available in their catalog. And, and that really starts to influence the business model and the strategy around generating revenue. And, and what we've seen is the more reasonable combinations of those lead to higher revenue. To have a single one size fits all of just one time, just pay as you go, just single product subscription or all you can eat doesn't, doesn't really facilitate the market need. It's about actually layering that complexity allows you to find the right product for the right person in the right way. And what matters to the consumer after you've been able to create the right data products, package it up, give them the right experience, ultimately they need to get the data. Uh, that's something that's really, really important is the distribution components, the information the way they need it. And that's what we see really at the, the high end of the market for those are sophisticated sellers are they have multiple distribution methods. They've got multiple ways to get the data to the consumer because that allows them to meet the needs of many uh, if you have a single method, you're typically burdening your customer. Again, it's not a bad way to start, and it's not a bad way if you're dealing with sophisticated consumers on the other side. Um, they will take the, a lot of data and just sort it out on their end. But more and more, if you want to open up a market, you want to open up the revenue streams, you want to, you've got to be able to provide multiple ways for the data consumer to get the data the way they need it. So we'll switch over and talk a little bit about pricing. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm dumping a lot of information in here, uh, but this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle before we get into the, the case study and then take questions. When you're thinking about pricing your data products, there's typically two models. There's the income method and the cost method. The income method is much harder to do for the current state of the market. It's, it's essentially getting uh, all comparable products you can find and their price points and finding your price within that. Right. Hard to do because that data is not readily, readily available. Um, some of it's, again, private sales, as we've, we've mentioned before. Uh, and this is a nascent market. You're, you're not seeing a total coverage from commercialization. But as Wayne mentioned at the beginning, you're seeing that trend really move quickly. So what we see more often in terms of pricing is cost, cost method. Right? You, you allocate the total expenditure to govern and produce the data product over its useful life as a baseline to create cost, um, or sorry, I should say a baseline to create price for it. Now, the big note on this is that doesn't mean though that's the value of your data. That's a way to get to the starting point for where you should, should potentially price it. Then there's two other really, really big components in terms of ultimately determining the value of that data to someone in the market. And that's the uniqueness of the data set, as in, do you have this data or does someone else have it? And I'll give an example of uh, a, a customer we're talking to, or, or a group we're talking to right now who has diagnostic data. Um, so they, they help facilitate ECGs and blood work. So they help broker uh, the technician reports to clinicians and they capture all that and they're looking to monetize it. So highly, highly unique data. Um, so it's highly valuable, the, the life, Span of it is, is essentially forever. Uh, but the addressable market, the, the, the consumers on the other side, as we get into it, it's not a big market. But it, it doesn't really have to be for them. They just need a series of, of, of customers who find value out of it. So we talked about the cost method for them. And now as we, we go into the, uh, discovering the market, we find that their data is truly unique. And it's not a large addressable market, but it doesn't matter because the price point they can charge for how unique the data is uh, makes it a valuable business line for them to, to pursue. So let me do my best to, to pull this all together in the CME story uh, and how they built a $100 million data business. Um, we've worked with them for, for years now. Uh, if you go to CME Data Mine, uh, that is our platform facilitating uh, the data licensing for them. Uh, they have both public, private, off, offline sales, curated experiences, they're doing the full multi-layered marketplace, which is why I wanted to use them as an example for this. What they've seen in over time curating and creating more products, granular products, creating segmented experiences, 
is that by doing so, they've actually 50% of their new customers business-wide, not in data licensing across the entire business, actually originated from a data sale. So they're seeing this huge benefit across the entire organization from this as an entry point. And they're also generating more revenue from this line. So 350% increase in subscription sets over the last couple of years. Um, they've had a, a massive increase in net new buyers amongst those subscriptions. And what's really impressive and, and is supposed to feed back into some of the points made earlier is their marketplace currently hosts over 75,000 individual data products for consumption. Uh, so operating at scale, having different customers, being able to access different products at different layers and different ways has allowed them to build this $100 million business. So at this stage, I'll pause here and take any questions people might have about data commercialization um, or some of these concepts we discussed throughout the presentation. It seems like there's no questions. Or, or Deborah, are you seeing questions on your side? I'm here. I was just going to let everybody know that if you have questions, on the right-hand side, there's a Q&A button, and there's also a chat button. So you're welcome to use those to ask any questions you have. Um, and Colin will be here for probably another seven or eight minutes or so. Um, we can also even, you know, I think we can allow people to talk through here as well. So I can double check on that for you. And um, yeah, we can. So if anybody has a question, let us know and, and we can have a discussion. Uh, so I see a question from Juan. How do teams manage the evolution of the data product from beta to fully productive and ready to use? Um, the, there's, I guess there's two, two different streams of answering that. There's the technical answer and the market answer. Uh, I'm going to give you the market answer. Uh, and if you'd like to follow up afterwards, we can talk more about the data supply chain and how we productize data. We actually did a webinar with Eckerson a few weeks ago uh, on specifically this topic. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you, you typically start as a bulk data provider um, and you give people more than less um, with obviously the caveats of proper security, governance, et cetera. Uh, and you take feedback, right? You, you give them the full list, you see what they use from it uh, and you systematically break that larger data set down into its granular products. And so our belief is it's very much market oriented in how you go from beta to fully productive to um, you know ready to use. And so I'm gonna say fully commercializable, fully optimized for market conditions would be the, the market answer to that. And then again, if you wanna follow up on the data supply chain, uh, just, just send us a note and we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, and then I see another question. Uh, are there any example of data product by income pricing? Um, so not off, not that I'd have prepared to show you at the moment. Um, there's, there's aggregated marketplaces where you can go and try to figure out what other people are doing. But this, this to Wayne's point at the very beginning of this, this is a very nascent market. There aren't true benchmarks for data products right now. So if, if you want to go through the income method, uh, it's really a, a full research project to go and try to source, look at all these different places. It's quite a challenging endeavor to take on. Um, so it's, it, there is no substitute for, for creating a research project. 
Uh, and I see a Q and A question. Speak on. So this is a question of can you speak to the legal aspect of this? Uh, so for example, if uh, if I buy data from product vendor one and then another vendor, are there legal frameworks for intellectual property ownership? And if the user wants to create new derivative data sets, absolutely. Uh, really great question around the legality of a data product. Um, one of the the ways we address, so I, I'm not the expert to talk on the specific regulations and the things you need to do within all of those. What I will say and, and our approach to managing governance compliance and the legal components of data productization and ultimately data licensing is we believe the there's there's the underlying data and information and then there's the data product which is the container to it. We believe in applying data level and user level restrictions to the data product. Um, though, and as well as if the data product is constructed of other data, so it's a product of products, we carry through the contractual and licensing rights of the underlying data products. So it's, it's really about um, how, if those things are present in the system, they can be enforced and should be enforced. And so it's really about uh, understanding your own data set, understanding the requirements that, that comes with the data, either first party or third party, imp bringing those in to your infrastructure, or, or in this case, bring it into Revelate. Uh, and then we can enforce those uh, as a configuration before the consumer even gets there. Like one of the best things you can do is not let people see data they shouldn't access. <laughs> like that's, that's one, and that's why we have the private versus public. We've talked about these different methods of servicing customers. If you have highly sensitive data, so let's talk about PII data, that has to be managed in a particular fashion. That is where we've partnered with Immuta to do data layer masking. So we have the ability to do all those granular level data policies and, and entitlements. But then that's also wrapped in this user enablement with let's only show those products to the people who should actually be able to access them. So hopefully that, I know that was a little ranty, but hopefully that answers your question, even though I'm, I apologize for not being the, the legal expert. Uh, I see another question here in the Q&A. At what point does the technicality of adopting the actual purchase signal profit for the business? So at what point does the technicality of adoption and the actual purchase signals profit the business? Uh, I'm not sure if I have a, I'm, I'm fully understanding the question. Um, would you be able to maybe throw that back in there and, and, and help clarify what you mean by the actual purchase signals profit for the business? Uh, and while you're, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll look and see if there's another question here. Uh, so I see another question. Do you have an example of a rule slash law that I can research further on this? Uh, I mean, those are some of the, the, the acronyms that came up earlier. You know, the GDPR is a big one. Um, there's HIPAA if you're dealing in healthcare. Uh, there's a variety of uh, existing and then new regulations coming in. Uh, those would be some that you can go take a look at. Uh, and the the answer is you know is the digital millennial copyright act relevant other laws they're, they're all relevant I and mean, it's it's hard to answer because you have to talk about the specific data that you're working within uh, not all data is governed the same not all laws and legislations apply to every single piece of data um, so you know GDPR is typically a consumer protection act um, that's looking at copyright so if you're reselling arts and images then yes potentially uh, there might be some some components so it, it really varies and that gets into the devil of being the details of what what data are data are you productizing, what data are you licensing, and and what do you need to consider when you're going through that licensing motion. Uh, okay, so sorry. Thank thank you for clarifying the question. So it's it's really about the margin analysis, like how much does it cost to acquire a customer, service a customer versus generating revenue for the business. Um, 
Really great question. Uh, we've got a really strong opinion that if you purchase and set up the right infrastructure, you don't need a lot of investment in managing it. So the example for, for CME is they only have a few people managing the, the actual expense side of that $100 million marketplace uh, because those 75,000 products we mentioned are all programmatically created. Uh, there's the ability for within our system for someone to make a request and for to automatically create a data product. And it does so by first checking against their, their, the policies and entitlements for that user and the da underlying data itself. So this is where you can see a huge lift in automation through this entire process. So we get out of the generating the revenue, we get into the, the cost of goods sold and what's involved in that. Then your cost is the marketing and sales efforts. Uh, and that's what I've tried to bring up at the beginning is you want to right size those, not only for the customer experience, but also for the scalability of your model. Um, then you get into the actual expense of managing the marketplace and servicing the data. And these days, particularly with our platform, the degree of automation you can apply can make it a very efficient uh, and high margin product. Uh, usually in the early days, it's not so much, right? You're still just, you're that bulk data provider. You've probably got more people staffed to it and you're growing into the economies of scale. But something like a, a CME group or some of the other larger groups that we work with, um, they have tremendous economies of scale uh, from the automation applied to data productization. And I hope I, I hope I understood the question right. I think we've got a minute left. Does anyone have any final questions? Well, I think we're heading over the wrap session. Well, well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your attendance. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel, feel free to follow up with uh, Revelate, and we look forward to chatting more with you.